Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin with breaking news out of Ukraine and a possible setback. The key city of Kherson appears to be in the hands of Russian forces as both sides meet today for a second round of talks. It's a strategic provincial capital in Ukraine's south. Overnight, the city's mayor said Russian troops have taken over the city's administration and people there have reported seeing Russian troops inside the city. However, the Ukrainian government has not confirmed the capture. This comes as Russia intensifies its attack on several of Ukraine's biggest cities. Some people who chose to stay now waiting to face their enemy. I hear the shots and explosions around me and momming, and that happens like a lot. We want to be angry when we die, not scared. And this morning, this stark number from the U.N., at least one million refugees have now fled Ukraine trying to escape the war, many forced to leave loved ones behind. What was it like leaving? It was like giving your, pretty much giving your soul to God. We, we, we all are just super, mentally we are broken. And uh, to be honest, I do have PTSD. I do. Very bad kind of. Every time I see, I hear sound or anything, I start shaking. Despite the carnage and possible setbacks, a new and defiant message from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and Ukraine officials say they are not only defending their country, but also launching counterattacks against Russian forces. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley kicks off our coverage this morning from the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. Yeah, Joan Savannah, it's a big day. One week into that Russian invasion of Ukraine, and, you know, they've only made modest advances. So far, they've only uh, really taken one city of any consequence, and that's just today. We just heard that Kherson, the city in the south uh, that's sitting on the Dnieper River, a strategic city and an important location for the Russian strategy here in Ukraine, has fallen to the Russians. Now, there's been some back and forth about whether or not it's actually fallen, but it seems as though, for all practical purposes, there are tanks in the street. Uh, the Russians have taken over some of the important administrative buildings. We've seen video. It seems that, like I said, for all practical purpose, this city is now in Russian hands. Now, uh, importantly, it looks as though the uh, Russians have managed to turn on the canal that runs from mainland Ukraine down into the Crimea Peninsula that had been taken, remember, the last time the Russians invaded back in 2014. The Ukrainians cut off that canal, and that created a lot of protests from farmers in Crimea who weren't able to water their crops. So now that canal is back on. That was maybe one of the major goals that the Russians had in Ukraine, as well as, of course, regime change in Kyiv. Um, but we're starting to see some of these elements that the Russians seem to have wanted here falling into place, among them creating a land bridge from the east of the country, from the Russian border in the east near Mariupol and near those separatist enclaves of Donetsk and Luhansk, and Crimea, that area that, as I mentioned, had been annexed back in 2014. But this, this town of Kherson, it's only about 300,000 people, and it says something, that one week into the fighting, this conflict that a lot of Western analysts, and myself included, had assumed would be over by now, that the Russians, with their overwhelming force, would have taken over this whole country very quickly. They've only made modest gains. Kherson is a major city, but it's pretty modest. It's rather small, and, uh, you know, it fell just today, one week into this conflict. It's remarkable the resistance that the Ukrainians have been putting up to the Russians. Guys? Matt Bradley in Lviv. Matt, thank you. Let's now bring in NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez in Moscow. Raf, good morning. So with it looking like Russian forces have taken control of this southern city, there's a lot of focus on what comes next, of course, especially in the capital of Kyiv. Satellite images show this Russian convoy still heading towards Kyiv, 40 miles long. It's, it's encountered some logistical challenges, but it doesn't mean it stops. Now, Russia's military forces have met resistance also from Ukrainians. What do we know at this point about Vladimir Putin's strategy? Savannah, good morning. Putin was looking for a knockout blow in the early days of this war, and that goal was reflected in his tactics, lightning advances by light armor, by elite troops, hoping to break the, Russia, the Ukrainian military in the first 48 hours or so of this fighting. Now, that hasn't happened. The Kremlin clearly underestimated the resistance of Ukrainian forces, of the Ukrainian government, and, frankly, of the Ukrainian people who were building Molotov cocktails and putting themselves 
themselves in the path of Russian tanks. The Pentagon says the Russians are now switching tactics. They seem to be regrouping around Kyiv. We see Russian forces encircling the city as that enormous convoy gets closer and closer to the capital. And we are also starting to see them heavily bombard not just Kyiv, but other cities like Kharkiv. And the big question looming is, will the Russian military turn to the kind of scorched earth tactics that we've seen them use in Syria, we've seen them use in Chechnya, where they effectively level the cities they're trying to take? Savannah? Of course, at the same time as the country is investigated for war crimes. So that's certainly something to keep an eye on. Now, Raf, Russia, that's an important note there, Russia has just now released an official death toll for their troops in Ukraine. Tell us how many they are saying have died. Of course, I'm emphasizing this because it is in contrast to what Ukraine is saying. And then also tell us what the Kremlin is saying about this death toll, about the lost troops. Yeah, so the Russian defense ministry now saying 498 Russian soldiers have been killed in the first week of fighting in Ukraine. And Savannah, that is the first time that the Russian public has got a sense of how many of its young men have been killed in this war launched in its name. Now, as you said, there's reasons to be skeptical about this official Russian toll. Both uh, Western and Ukrainian officials are saying the real toll is probably much higher. But just assuming for a second that that number number of 498 is accurate. That is more troops than the U.S. lost in the entire first year of fighting in Iraq in 2003. It's more troops than Britain lost in 20 years of fighting in Afghanistan. So that gives you a sense of the scale of losses. Now, the Kremlin has said this is a great tragedy for the Russian people, but that Russian forces will continue fighting against what they say are the neo-Nazis of the Ukrainian government. That's a claim they've been making over and over again. Savannah, we should point out the president of Ukraine is himself Jewish. Savannah? Mm, yeah. Raf, now the U.S. State Department says Russia's government has restricted news organizations, throttled Internet services as ways to try to control information inside Russia about the situation in Ukraine. What is the Kremlin doing in response to media outlets covering this invasion? So the Kremlin has banned independent Russian media outlets, the few that are still out there, from referring to what's happening in Ukraine as a war, as an attack, as an invasion. The Kremlin's term is special military operation, and they are censoring any Russian media outlet that deviates from that line. The U.S. State Department has spoken out against this crackdown on Russian media. They put out a statement earlier. I want to read you just a little bit of it. They say, Russia is engaged in an unprovoked war on Ukraine. At home, the Kremlin is engaged in a full assault on media freedom and truth and Moscow's efforts to mislead and suppress the truth of the brutal invasion are intensifying. Savannah, I'll tell you, there's a popular Russian radio channel here, which splits its time 50-50 between music and news. One of the anchors went on the air yesterday saying, we're going to stop giving the news because we do not want to spread the lies the Kremlin is forcing wow. us to tell. Savannah? That takes bravery there. All right, Raf Sanchez, thank you so much for your reporting. Now, the U.S. continues to walk a fine line in Ukraine, providing arms and aid, but not actually joining the fight with boots on the ground. In an exclusive interview with nightly news anchor Lester Holt, the U.S. Secretary of Defense spoke about the stakes and the realities on the ground. We've been watching this, this convoy that's got the world's attention. It was reported. It was <clears throat> stalled. Should we read too much into that? Is it still a potent fighting machine? There's a lot of combat power uh, that the Russians still have available to them. Um, so they have a number of options uh, uh, going forward. You know, one of those options, by the way, Lester, is that Putin can choose is that he can choose to de-escalate and he can choose to uh, pursue a diplomatic solution, and we hope that, that he does that. I think that the world has been stunned. Some part of the world has been inspired. But what we've seen by Ukrainian troops and civilians who have, have answered the call. But is it time, is it necessary to do a reality check on, on what they're facing, the size of, of the Russian force? We, we are all uh, inspired uh, by what we see uh, from the Ukraine, not just the Ukrainian forces, but Ukrainian people. It's hard to predict uh, which way things are going to go. I'm sure that the Russians would have never predicted that they would be in a place that they are in uh, at this point. Our focus is to 
make sure that we do everything possible uh, to provide as much uh, uh, support uh, to the Ukrainians so that they can defend themselves. What do you make of these reports of Russian troops simply walking away, surrendering? Can you confirm them? Are you aware of them? We, we don't have uh, aircraft in the air over uh, Ukraine. We also don't have any boots on the ground. So it's very difficult to, to confirm things. But what I will tell you is that a professional military always uh, takes seriously uh, uh, the issue of recovering its, uh, its fallen. This is a very important thing, uh, uh, not only for morale, but it's just the way that, uh, that business is conducted. And we've seen pictures and, and video of Russian soldiers, the bodies of Russian soldiers that apparently have been left. Is that, as as a, a general, as, as a soldier, did that shock you? I think that's, uh, that's beyond disappointing. If that is the case, it's disgusting uh, from, uh, from my standpoint. Uh, you know, I think uh, leaders owe it to their, to their troops uh, to, uh, to take care of them. Uh, and if something happens to them, uh, to, uh, to recover their remains. Ukrainians and others have called for this idea of a no-fly zone to be patrolled by the U.S. to keep the Russian airplanes out of the sky. Is that a non-starter for you? President Biden's been clear, Lester, that, uh, you know, U.S. troops uh, won't, uh, won't fight Russia uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and if you establish a no-fly zone, uh, certainly, uh, you, uh, in order to enforce that no-fly zone, uh, you'll have to engage uh, Russian aircraft. And again, that would put us uh, uh, at war with Russia. We heard Vladimir Putin's words about nuclear weapons. Have you seen any actions to back up those words, anything that suggests a new posture toward the West? Any rhetoric about uh, the, the employment of nuclear weapons is, is dangerous. Uh, and, uh, and I think we should, uh, we should avoid that, uh, if at all possible. I think it, uh, it creates a climate uh, or it creates the conditions for mi uh, gross miscalculations. Uh, and uh, we certainly don't want to see that happen. I am very uh, comfortable with our, with our posture. And I am confident that we can, uh, we can defend uh, not only ourselves, but our allies and our partners. Mr. Secretary, you and I are both children of, of the Cold War. Does it feel back to the future for you now to see this conflict? We certainly didn't envision being here in 2022 uh, in, uh, you know, in, in Europe. And we don't have to be here. We didn't have to be here. This is a choice by one man. But again, I think it speaks to the relevance of the NATO alliance. Uh, I got to tell you, it's impressive to see the way that uh, that countries have come together uh, for a common cause. It certainly is. Our thanks to Lester Holt for that interview. Let's bring in national security expert Jason Beardsley. He's the national executive director of the Association of the U.S. Navy. Jason, good to have you with us. I want to ask you about something the Secretary of Defense just said in that interview with Lester, that the U.S. hopes Putin will de-escalate and explore a diplomatic solution. There is a second round of talks happening in Belarus today. So what would a diplomatic solution even look like at this point with so many Ukrainians already killed and so much destruction? Well, uh, thanks for the uh, question and good morning. I think the uh, diplomatic solution for Vladimir Putin is simple. He uh, needs to save face while walking away with as much control, at least nominally, of some of the eastern province in Ukraine, that's the Donbass region. And um, I think because he's got forces aligned in Kiev and other places, he'd like to kind of walk away with peeling back some of the sanctions that, of course, are hurting the Russian economy. So a uh, diplomatic solution for him means his troops are stalled out on the ground they're losing this war, and uh, he gambled, he lost that gamble, and now he's going to look for a way to kind of uh, save face and remain in power. The only way to do that is if he's very clever, and uh, so far we're, we're, we haven't seen much ovations in that direction, but it's good that they're talking. It has been only eight days so far, but Ukrainian officials say around 2,000 civilian lives have been lost so far. Ukraine is putting up an incredible fight, not just the military, but also civilians. How long do you think they can keep that up? Years. Um, we went to Iraq with overwhelming force, and a lot of people think war is about numbers. It's not about math. It's about spirit. I think Reagan once said there's no weapon or arsenal in the world that can match the free-spirited peoples fighting for their homelands. That's what we're seeing here. And again, uh, I've been in combat. 
and watching it on the ground doesn't matter how many tanks you have or how many trucks if the will of the people has not been broken they will continue to fight until the last uh, scrap of earth so russia is not facing a, a, a very easy uh, solution here and their best move is to take what they've already gotten sort of earned uh, by the diplomatic community in the east and walk away and i think you're going to see that spirit is a weapon we perhaps don't talk enough about uh well we have you i want to ask you about china it is not joined in issuing sanctions against russia what impact does that decision have on putin and do you fear at all china may look at this and perhaps follow russia's lead in its growing tensions with taiwan yeah, what a great question. China's a real uh, player in this. Uh, number one, they've eyed the provinces of uh, uh, Ukraine themselves uh, for their Silk Road initiative. They're eyeballing the factory in Zaporizhia down by the Dnieper River, which uh, produces the motor uh factory, the engines that uh, fill their airplanes and helicopters. China is not looking uh, at the end of this uh, for Russia to actually take all the control here. They kind of want some control themselves. And the, the better that Putin does, does, the easier it is for them to look across the straits at Taiwan. Here's the lesson, though. Let's get Taiwan ready and armed up first. We were too late on Ukraine. Stingers, toes, javelin missiles, all that stuff has to be done before the invasion begins. And the United States has a unique opportunity right now to reinforce what the international community is finally saying in Ukraine, which is it's time to make sure that these people can defend themselves. Jason, good to have you on this morning. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Now, the United Nations says at least one million people have fled Ukraine since Russia invaded last week, creating a refugee crisis in neighboring countries. NBC News correspondent Jay Gray joins us now from Poland along the border with Ukraine and the country that's received the most of these refugees. Jay, good morning. So you were at a train station, I know, yesterday when we spoke with you. More than 2,000 children, including yeah. orphans, arrived from Ukraine at the time that you were right. there. Tell us what was that like? I mean, we're hearing these accounts of people getting off of these trains exhausted, frightened. How are these children? What did you see and what are you seeing now today? Well, well you just see the stunned faces of so many who are, are trying to uh, get to safety, but leaving everything they know and, and oftentimes loved ones behind. You can see we're at the border, the crossing right here, but I want to show you something. We continue to see a flow of people come through and you talked about the children. Their families like these, and, and they've walked across some with suitcases, with plastic bags. You see the kids here with their stuffed animals and uh, one here with a violin. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you just see repeatedly. Everything they have is in these bags. Everything that they are going to use to start over, they are carrying by hand and walking across the border. It, it's... Um, it's really unfathomable to think uh, what is happening here and, and with so many. I mean, this is not an individual event. This is a situation uh, that, that we're seeing, again, just over and over as they walk across the border here. Yeah, absolutely. Jay, Jay, you mentioned that they have these bags. It's all they have. So kind of two questions here. In, in your experience, does it seem that people's plan is to return home? if and, and when they potentially can? And also, what's happening when they do get there? Are they finding family? Is it volunteers? Where are they going? What's the plan? Yeah, that, that's going to be a big issue, Savannah. And, and I just got word that this family is from the coastal town of Odessa. That mm. is so far away from where we are right now. So to make that journey for them has been very difficult. Uh, what's going to happen? We're noticing already today with the influx of people coming over as the violence gets more extreme. Uh, so does the wave of people coming in. And, and so as they continue to walk across the border here for the first time today, as we made our way closer to the border, we saw what was a makeshift tent city in a park of uh, people that just set up what they could, where they could. And, and so finding a place for these families, for these people, is fast becoming a problem here. And everybody talks about the humanitarian crisis. Well, that's where it's going to be so difficult. We're already over a million people who've left Ukraine and, and headed to border countries, most of them coming here to Poland. They're going to have to solve that problem pretty quickly because there are a lot more people on the way. Yeah, I mean, the UN's actually predicting 5 million people is what it could get up to during this war. What is yeah. a place like Poland doing to prepare for an influx of even more than that nearly half a million that that country alone has seen? Yeah, what they're doing right now is as soon as people come across the border and get established, they're moving them out. Some going to Warsaw, some going to Krakow. So 
going to other European countries, but they've got to get a more developed system in place, and you just can't do that because you don't know where these families are going to want to go. You asked me earlier about whether they're going to be able to get back home. So many of them don't know the answer to that question. None of us do in reality, but they, they want to stay as close as possible mm -hmm. in case they have the opportunity to go back. And, and that's the goal for everybody here. And so keeping them close is what's going to be so difficult. Uh, again, there's just a, a limited amount of space, and, and this area is being overrun by people who need to be here for safety reasons. Mm, absolutely. Jay Gray, thank you so much. Really powerful reporting from the ground. Stay safe. Our breaking news coverage out of Ukraine will continue, but we're also following some other big stories this morning. After the break, America's fight against COVID entering a new phase as the CDC rolls back some of its recommendations. Plus, the latest on the investigation into the insurrection at the Capitol, including new claims of criminal conspiracy against former President Trump. You're watching Morning News now. Welcome back. You're seeing scenes of devastation in Kyiv this morning as the capital of Ukraine comes under increasing attack from Russian forces. We're monitoring the latest, of course, out of Ukraine this morning, and we'll have more coming up in just a few minutes. But we do want to get some other stories making headlines this morning. The CDC is no longer recommending universal contact tracing, a measure that many health officials relied on to track COVID outbreaks and try to keep numbers down. The decision was made in part by the overwhelming Omicron surge. Agencies just could not keep up with testing results. The CDC also found COVID testing was no longer an effective tool to track outbreaks. The move comes as the White House COVID Task Force unveils its plan to turn the corner in the fight against the pandemic. The plan focuses on treating cases and preparing for new variants while also avoiding shutdowns. Let's bring in Dr. Bob Lahita for more on this. He's a professor at the Hackensack Meridian Medical School and the director of the Institute for Autoimmune and Rheumatic Diseases at St. Joseph Health. Dr. Bob, always good to have you with us. Walk us through this decision to stop contact tracing. What's the CDC going to focus on instead? And, and what does this mean for everyday testing? Well, people are testing at home now. Many people have been vaccinated, over 75% of the population. And so we don't know who is positive and whether those positive people will ever be known to anybody, unless you wind up in the hospital or in the intensive care unit, Joe. So the CDC is now concentrating on things like sewage examination to see whether there are any blips or any new variants with genomic testing. There's been new funding for genomic laboratories. And that's the direction that we're going in at the present time. I want to ask you about the World Health Organization. It says pregnant women in the Americas have been disproportionately affected by COVID. Their mortality rates are significantly higher compared with the rest of the world. So now that the virus is receding in the U.S., how important is it that we focus on family planning services and women's health? How do we get more people to resume some of their routine care? Well, Joe, women do generally better than men when they get infected with COVID. But in the Americas, and that's the Caribbean and Latin America, the 72 percent of those patients were women who were pregnant, and there were social factors that prevented them from getting prenatal care, et cetera, because they were infected, and the, the agencies that did that kind of care weren't interested in treating them. So about 3,000 out of 365 of those women died in the Americas. And actually, that's the one of the parts of the world where the, there's a bump up, like 16 percent increase in infections in Jamaica, Trinidad, countries like Tobago. Uh, so it is a big problem and that we shouldn't be complacent and think that the rest of the world is going down in infections like we are here in the United States. Finally, Dr. Bob, I want to ask you about uh, Virginia Senator Tim Kaine. He revealed he's suffering from long COVID symptoms and has been doing it for two years since his diagnosis. He's now introduced a bill to fund research into the long-term effects of COVID and expand treatment resources. How important is this to help us better understand this mystery of long COVID? This is really extraordinarily important, and it's also scientifically and medically fascinating, Joe. First of all, long-haul long COVID consists mostly of muscle aches, fatigue, shortness of breath, brain fog, uh, a bad rash that goes on and on and on. 35% of those with COVID have not fully recovered after three weeks. 10% go way beyond three weeks, and less than 10% go on for years 
So you lose your taste, you lose your smell. It's a chronic, complex, multi-factor condition. And we in medicine have all asked, what is the reason for this occurring in certain people, but not everybody? And it favors men in particular because men seem to suffer greater, as I told you in the past in the past note, that men tend to get COVID in worse form than women. So this is a big issue. Yeah, those are big numbers and something we're going to be wrestling with for quite some time. Dr. Bob Lahida, as always, thank you so much. Turning now to the latest on the investigation into the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And there's a couple pieces of news here. In a new court filing, the House Committee investigating the insurrection claims former President Trump and members of his campaign were part of a conspiracy to overturn the 2020 presidential election results. Now, this comes as the first trial related to the attack gets underway. Opening statements took place just yesterday in a federal courtroom in the trial of a Texas man, Guy Reffitt. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us now with the latest. Ali, good morning. So first, Let's start with this court filing and sort of explain what it means or the significance of the House committee, what they must have in order to go ahead and take this step. And I know it really focuses on this Trump allied lawyer. Tell us, tell yeah. us what we know here. Yes, yeah, Savannah, this is major. There's no other way to put it. Technically, it's a court filing trying to get the documents of John Eastman, who was a Trump ally who was advising him on ways that he could help to overturn the election results. Eastman has argued repeatedly with the January 6th committee that he can't turn over documents because of attorney-client privilege or even talk about some of his conversations with Trump. And what we learned in this legal filing is he's one of those allies who said that he would come forward and plead the fifth in the committee. There's a transcript included in this really lengthy trove of filings here, and they include part of Eastman's transcript where he does plead the fifth over a hundred times in that briefing. But what's really stunning here is the part of the filing where they say that they believe that former President Donald Trump and others committed conspiracy to defraud the United States. I want to read just a little piece of that filing where they say the select committee has a good faith basis for concluding that the president and members of his campaign engaged in a criminal conspiracy to defraud the United States. So again, the filing itself, which will be argued next week in California, that filing is in regards to John Eastman trying to get him to turn over documents and to continue to cooperate with them. But the headline here is it's sort of a backdoor way into saying that they think that President Donald Trump did something illegal, something criminal, while he was in office in his efforts to overturn the election. It's really important to point out here, a former president has never been charged with a crime, but what this does is eventually, it's sort sort of shows us where this has been going and what we've imagined where it was going all along, which is eventually it could fall at the feet of the Department of Justice and Merrick Garland to decide, are they going to bring a case here? And that's a pretty stunning moment in history if and when we get to that point. And also, as people have heard about so much lack of cooperation here, it shows us a step beyond subpoenaing to try to figure out exactly what's going on yeah. here. Ali, let's now turn to that first trial, as I mentioned, related to the attack underway now. What is this person, Guy Reffitt, this Texas man, accused of? What's his connection to the attack and what happened yesterday as this got underway? Yeah, this is the first of what will be hundreds, Savannah. There were hundreds of people who were arrested for what they did at the Capitol on January 6th. Guy Reffitt is the first of them, and he didn't get into the building, but the allegations here are that he was, in the words of the prosecutor, the match that lit the spark, or I believe if I'm looking, yeah, the match that started the fire, in part because he had a, he was alleged to have a pistol on his hip, but also the prosecutors in their opening arguments yesterday, they talked a little bit about the messages that Refit had sent. What his lawyers, though, are arguing are that he is someone who's prone to hyperbole and that he wasn't actually going to follow through with the things that he said he was going to do. And it really does lay the groundwork here because it's the first, watching the ways in which both the government argues its case, using so much of the evidence that they have from messages from these folks, but also video evidence of what was happening on that day. And then, of course, the way that the defendants end up arguing their cases here as well, really important as we're about to see hundreds of these go forward over the course of the next few months and years. Hundreds. So much to watch for. We know you'll keep us updated. Ali Vitale, thank you so much. Let's get a check on your morning news now, weather. Which means it's time for Bill Cairns to join us on this Thursday. Hey, Bill. 
Do you know it was 84 degrees in Kansas City yesterday? You know how ridiculous that is for this time of year? <laughs> Sounds uh, like barbecue weather. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like, you know, I, I, oops, I got a sunburn in yeah. the beginning of March. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we had record highs yesterday. and uh, Also, St. Louis was 82 for a record high yesterday. So things are changing, though, because you know, March is just this wild roller coaster where you still have all that cold air up in Canada. And every now and then, you know, the warm air surges from the south. But then the cold air comes rushing back, and that's happening this morning. So we went from yesterday, you know, 84 in Kansas City to right now it feels like 30 degrees when you walk outside because that cold air is moving down from the north. International Falls has a wind chill of negative 16. So there's some really cold air out there in the northern half of the country. Even northern New England, Syracuse, 9. Burlington, Vermont, 1. And that cold air is now moving into New York City, too. So New York City only had one mild day yesterday, and that was it. But the rest of the country, it's going to stay warm today. Oklahoma City stays at 77, Denver 75. And this continues from the southern plains all the way to the south right through the weekend. Tomorrow, 80 in Amarillo, 80s all the way down to Jackson, Mississippi. Temperatures easily 10 to 20 degrees warmer than they should be. And make your weekend plans outside, outdoors Atlanta, 77 on Saturday, 80 on Sunday. And how about Washington, D.C., a beautiful 64 Saturday. And then you get toasty on Sunday and Monday with temperatures in the mid-70s in the nation's capital. So, yeah, uh, record warmth today, Texas possible to the Carolinas, but... Joe, Minneapolis, 25 degrees. This is like, if you live in the northern half of the country at the beginning of March, you're just better off not paying attention to end the weather anywhere else because you know you have to wait patiently and hopefully not being frustrated like someone that's sitting right here. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, in the spring in Minnesota, we would have to shovel the tennis courts to go practice. So, you know. We're used to it. That seems like maybe it's just not time yet to practice. <laughs> it was April. For it was sports. April. It was time. That was the problem. <laughs> it was April. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bill. I'm right with you. I was throwing baseballs in April in the snow. So, yeah, yeah I get it. <laughs> Got to practice. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. And coming up on Morning News Now, understanding the oligarchy as war rages in Ukraine, we look at the small circle of billionaires who are helping to fund the attacks. And one million refugees in counting. How one American organization is working to help people in Ukraine who are still trying to flee their war-torn country. Task Force Klepto Capture is a new initiative set up by the Justice Department to go after Russian oligarchs. Yeah, we've heard the term a lot lately, but what exactly is an oligarch and how do these people get so rich and so powerful? NBC News Now anchor Holly Jackson has some answers for us. The modern Russian oligarch's story starts back in 1989. Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. The wall fell, and soon after, in 1991, so did the Soviet Union. Eastern Europe is free. The Soviet Union itself is no more. This is a victory for democracy and freedom. After almost 70 years of Russian communism, where the state controlled everything, the Russian people saw huge political and economic change practically overnight. For most regular Russians, this seismic shift was chaotic. But for a select few businessmen known as oligarchs, they managed to rise to the top. The word itself is Greek, derived from oligarchy and means rule of the few. An oligarch is one of those few. With the state no longer controlling major economic sectors, rich men who had been gaining wealth often in Russia's legitimate businesses and allegedly in the black market stood ready to take control if they had political connections. And many of them did. 1996, it looked as if the communists might return to power in the presidential election. Oligarchs stood together to help Boris Yeltsin's re-election. Infighting inside those elite circles helped bring on the Russian financial crisis of 1998, which in turn helped the rise of Vladimir Putin. At the time, the future president was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB, reportedly gathering information on these oligarchs and the illegal ways they got rich. The oligarchs largely stood in line with Putin as he rose in the political ranks to prime minister, then president, and they've stayed in line, but that may be changing. Many of these so-called oligarchs have investments in the West, some calling for negotiations to start as soon as possible, others calling for an end to the war altogether.
All right, our thanks to Hallie Jackson for that explanation. And we've been reporting about that staggering number of refugees who have fled Ukraine, a million so far. It is a rapidly growing humanitarian crisis in Europe. Well, one extraordinary group of American volunteers is leading its own evacuation operation in Ukraine. It's called Project Dynamo, a privately run organization largely made up of current and former U.S. military. And it's rescued more than 60 people from Ukraine so far, thousands more, though, are requesting help. Joining us now is Project Dynamo co-founder Brian Stern. Brian, good morning to have you with us. We're glad to check in again with your organization. You're, you're now in the middle of your sixth rescue mission, which you've named after the Apollo mission. So tell us, what are you seeing there on the ground and, and how has it changed over the last week? Well, first, I'm uh, proud to report that we've concluded our sixth rescue operation since, uh, since you guys got the data. We're just short, I think, of 100 people that we've gotten out so far. We, we may actually be over 100. I'm just not tracking it. Uh, what we're seeing on the ground is, uh, you know, this is an open this is open war zone. We are in conflict here. Um, like any other conflict, it's dangerous. It's scary. Innocent people are stuck in the middle of it. Uh, the, the soldiers on each side are, are fighting and doing what they need to do for their interests, but the civilians are kind of caught in the middle of it. And uh, that's, that's what we're trying to help. Now, there are a lot of civilians who are requesting help from you. Your organization says around 2,000 people have requested evacuation just through your website. I understand they're American citizens, but also people from the U.K., Nigeria, Afghanistan, France, elsewhere. Tell us exactly how this is working. Tell us about the logistical challenges you're facing. I mean, we're just seeing these images of terror, of, of convoys on roads, of obviously what's happening in these cities. How is this working that you're able to get people out, so many people? And in fact, I understand even some of them with special needs. How are you doing this and keeping people safe? Uh, it's hard. Uh, Project Dynamo was formed in the kind of in the shadows or in the middle of the uh, Af uh, the, uh, the evacuation of, of Afghanistan and Kabul. So we have a lot of lessons learned. We've been at this. Um, I didn't think we'd be at it. We, I, I never really thought that we'd be at it this long, but we have been, and we have uh, we have some really, really, really good tactics, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that that ensure, to the greatest extent possible, safety. Just as a point of clarification, uh, again, it's it's a, the data changes constantly. We're we're driving steadily toward nine thousand requests. So uh, very, very, very quickly, we are we are uh, we, you know we're busy. We're doing operations. We're running and gunning. We're doing what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So the the logistics chain to do these things is fundamentally different than Afghanistan. I can't use aircraft. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of differences and things that I can't do. But there's other things that I can do. As an example, the neighboring countries uh, of Ukraine have been uh, those borders are open and they've been overwhelmingly generous. I was in Romania yesterday, and the uh, the Ukrainian border uh, folks and the Romanian border folks are doing the best they can with it with a truly overwhelming situation. And the U.S. State Department is definitely uh, they're definitely in it to win it. So um, I, I'm happy to report that while it is a terrible situation and it is hard and it's long and frustrating and all the things that go into a, a crisis. Uh, I'm very happy to report that everyone is definitely rowing in the same direction. Mm. That's for sure. Clearly a fluid situation. 9,000 requests, around 100 people rescued so far. You're inspiring a lot of people with this message. People who are watching this right now might be wondering, how can they help? Yeah, the two, the two things that we need is, uh, number one, if, if you do need help, if you are in need of assistance from mm -hmm. us in Ukraine, please go to our website, projectdynamo.org, and there's a form there. There's a button. You click the form. If you don't do that, I, we can't find you. And if we can't find you, I can't pull you out. So um, please, 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 the, the Russian government likes to play cyber games and stuff and turn off email and communication and cell phones. The other thing is, is please donate. Please donate. We're donor funded. Uh, every dollar, every dollar helps. Uh, every dollar that you give goes to saving a life. None of us are paid. I'm a volunteer. Please donate. All right, Brian, thank you for the update. Thank you for everything you're doing. We'll continue to check in with you. Yeah, Appreciate what it. What you're doing is thank amazing. You, Seeing those selfies of people smiling as you're rescuing them from a situation like this is just really so powerful. Brian, thank you so much. Now, we're following new developments this morning concerning the Paralympic Games in Beijing after more fallout from this war in Ukraine. Janice Mackey Freyer joins us with more on that and some of the other latest updates from around the world. Janice, good morning.
Hey, good morning. The uh, about face at the Paralympic Games with the uh, International Paralympic Committee now reversing a decision saying that they will ban athletes from Russia and Belarus from competing at the Games, which are set to get underway this weekend. Now, just a day ago, these same officials had said that athletes would be allowed to compete as neutrals, but the backlash over that decision was swift, it was severe, and it was widespread. Athletes have since threatened to pull out. There were worries about the viability of the Games and actual safety concerns with emotions running so high. The Ukraine team has 20 athletes here with nine guides, and the opening ceremony is set for tomorrow night. Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, is donating a month's salary to Ukraine relief efforts for refugees. The vice president of, the, of Taiwan is going to uh, donate as well. The war in Ukraine has generated a lot of feeling among Taiwanese who say they understand the threat of a powerful neighbor. Taiwan will also send 27 tons of medical supplies to Ukraine. And if you're curious, because I know you are, the president's salary is said to be about $14,000 a month. And with Russia bearing down on Ukrainian cities, animal sanctuaries are struggling to get animals to safer places. Workers from a zoo in Poland are said to be waiting at the border to take animals from the Save Wild Sanctuary near Kyiv. There were some photos on Facebook showing a lion in a cage in the back of a truck. Now, roads, of course, are very unsafe, but the animals are apparently becoming stressed because of the explosions. And as well, Ukraine's only gorilla is feeling lonely because he doesn't have any visitors. Reminder, so many facets to this crisis. Janice, thank you for that update. Appreciate it. Coming up on Morning News Now, we're going to take a closer look at the human side of war. Survive. Uh, Mentally, how did you survive? I don't think I did. When we return, hear from one Ukrainian woman forced to flee after losing loved ones in the invasion. That's next. We're back now with one refugee's story detailing her escape from Ukraine. It's been a harrowing week with trauma and loss, but she has a powerful message to the world. Here's Cal Perry with the emotional story. How old are you? At a refugee center in Lviv, we meet 24-year-old Katrina Balash. Like so many Ukrainians, she's now hundreds of miles from her home. I left Kharkiv two days ago when uh, things got worse and my house got bur burned by a bomb and uh, my, my loved ones died, so. Who died? My, my friends. She says her friends were killed as they sheltered together in a basement. Russian bombs destroying everything in sight. So it's pretty much done. My whole city is just dust. For her, surviving the assault feels like a fate worse than death. What's it like to see your friends die? It's... You know... It would rather be me not seeing it dying for you than me seeing you dying, you know? You wish it had been you. In that particular moment, yes. Katerina's escape from Kharkiv, a harrowing but vital journey. Her train stopping in Kyiv, the violence all around her. The experience leaving her forever changed. Mentally, how did you survive? I don't think I did. We, we, we all are just super mentally we are broken and uh, to be honest, I do have PTSD. I do. Very bad kind of. Every time I see, I hear sound or anything, I start shaking. And my friends, they bring uh, some medical stuff to get me back to normal you know, condition. Katerina hasn't eaten or slept properly for six days. But somehow her message to anyone who is listening is crystal clear. Please do cherish a clear sky. Every time you see sky, cherish every moment of your life. Powerful image right there. Thanks to Cal Perry for that report. The European Union is taking more action to isolate Russia from the international financial system amid this ongoing invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, Bertha Coombs joins us now to tell us more about what these actions, these sanctions mean for Russians and their money. Hi, Bertha. Good morning. 
Hey, good morning, Savannah and Joe. The European Union is excluding seven Russian banks from the SWIFT messaging system. This is a mes messaging system that helps facilitate payment transactions as the West steps up sanctions on Moscow. The U.S., U.K., Europe and Canada pledging last weekend to remove some Russian banks from SWIFT, potentially damaging Russia's economy as well as its trading partners. The EU list includes Russia's second largest bank, VTB, Gazprom Bank, and Sherbank, Russia's largest lender. They are, are not on the list because they are the main lines for payments for Russian oil and gas, which EU countries are still buying because they need to. Russia's big banks are deeply integrated on the, in the global financial system. Sanctions are already being felt beyond Russia's borders. Surebank's European arm has been forced to close after a run on that bank. Meantime, how it's impacting stocks this morning, it looks like Wall Street is going to open kind of flat, slightly lower after stocks recovered yesterday, most of Tuesday's losses. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell telling Congress that the Fed remains committed to fighting inflation through raising interest rates despite the uncertainty that we're seeing in Ukraine. Powell signaling that the Fed will likely raise rates by a quarter percent later this month. Meantime, oil prices continue to surge today to levels not seen since 2008 on fears of supply disruptions from the war in Ukraine. So one thing to watch, the oil prices are really, really going to make everyone's job much more difficult. Back to you. And a lot of folks yeah. are worried about all, all across the globe. Bertha, thank you so much. Coming up on Morning News Now, responsibility in reporting. Yeah, next we'll look at how media from around the world are covering the war in Ukraine and how it's shaping people's views of what's happening. That's next. Media organizations from around the world are in Ukraine, covering the attacks all day and all night. Yeah, we want to bring you a closer look at the process behind the scenes, how stories get covered, what our responsibility as journalists is in a time like this, and also the Russian propaganda machine. Joining us now is Beth Noble. She's an associate professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. She's also the former Moscow bureau chief for CBS. Hi, Beth. Good morning. This is such an important topic, so thank you so much for joining us. Before we get to the West and journalism and, and how our processes work, let's start first with this Russian propaganda machine. I mean, we're obviously seeing this being reported on everywhere, but all coverage is not the same, and that's certainly true within the borders of Russia. In fact, the State Department has said that Russia is engaged in a full assault on media freedom and truth. For someone who, you know, has not, has never, is living in the West, has never consumed this information, explain just how big this problem is, the impact that it's having on this war, and the impact it has on Russian citizens. Yeah, thanks, Savannah. Um, I think one of the biggest differences between the Russian media and our media is that the bulk of Russian media is either owned outright by the state or it's controlled by uh, oligarchs who are friendly to the Kremlin. And what that means is that most Russians are not getting anywhere near an authentic view of this war. The outlets have been told that they can't use words like war or invasion to describe what's going on in Ukraine. And I noticed that they are picking images that fail to show the real situation. Just watching the Russian news this morning, I noticed that they were showing things like minor shots of damage in small towns, like broken windows and bullet holes through fences, rather than what's actually going on in large cities like Kharkiv and, and Kiev, where there's been massive amounts of destruction of the center of the city. Uh, they showed a couple of tanks today on a highway heading towards Kiev, rather than the large convoys and the full-out war that are going on in some parts of Ukraine. They're grasping at anything they can show um, to demonstrate that the world is actually on the side of Russia here and not Ukraine. Like last night, they were showing reports about Serbia and Montenegro and Venezuela, um, some of the countries who haven't banned Russian flights. Uh, and so the message here from the Russian side is that the bad guys are the U.S. and Ukraine. Wow. What they're seeing in Russia is very different from what we're seeing here in the West. Yeah. How do you think Western media is doing covering this crisis? And what is our responsibility right now. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I think that the Russian uh, media, you know, could learn a lot of lessons about how to cover a war from the U.S. media. I really salute my colleagues who are out there in the war zone. I think uh, American press has done a fantastic job of really uh, getting to a lot of parts of Ukraine and to the areas around Ukraine that are being affected and giving uh, us a really good view of what's actually happening on the ground. And of course, they're uh, aided by the fact that we have social media and and so many people who are all over Ukraine are uploading videos to show us what's going on in their area. I mean, uh, Ukraine is a huge country, and it's hard for Western journalists to be everywhere. Yeah, when you talk about that with social media and the way people get information now, that's so different from, from World War II, obviously. Very quickly, how do you think that has impacted how countries respond to what's happening in Ukraine? Yeah, well, obviously, it was a totally different uh, situation in World War II, where people were getting their news from uh, from the print media, from newspapers, from magazines, and from the new medium of radio, which really created live news as we know it. Um, and so I think we're incredibly lucky now that we have uh, not only so many news sources of our own, but that we can create news sources for the people in Russia uh, who may not be getting uh, good news from their own sources. I, I read last night that the readership of the BBC Russian language service is up three times from a year ago. Um, and that's something that the West has traditionally done, given uh, sources of information uh, to people who can't get them in their own countries. Absolutely. Beth Noble, such important information here as we continue to cover this unfolding situation. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.